it is strongly recommended to first watch my recently stored and colorized video about D-Day before proceeding to watch this video. Last month my wife and I visited the D-Day area in Normandy. This video captures the highlights of our visit in the form of then and now, historic versus present day footage. The first place that we visited was the German gun battery number WN48 at Longue sur Mer. This battery consists of four concealed heavy guns in concrete bunkers located 300 meters inland from the 35 meter high cliff edge at the beach. These guns used 15 cm shells and had a range of about 20 km, thus being able to cover both adjacent beaches, Gold and Omaha. The guns today are still intact and the munition storage behind the guns can still be seen. Each of these guns were guided by a two-story high command post in a bunker near the edge of the cliff. The battery was damaged on D-Day itself and completely put out of action the next day, after which it played no further role during the Normandy campaign. On top of my list to visit in Normandy was Uno Beach. In particular I wanted to see the house that played such an important role in the most famous film of the Canadian landings, shot by Sergeant Bill Grant. In the film we see the doors of the landing craft swing open and the house appear in the opening. This is the actual house. It is still standing but hardly looks the same due to the extensions with the shutters built against the front. For those who wish to visit the house it is located at Boulevard des Français in Bernières sur Mer. Two other buildings in Bernières sur Mer were on my list too. First of all Canada House, that was the first house at Uno Beach to be liberated. It is where the 8th Canadian Infantry Assault Brigade Group stormed the beach and among other the Queen's Own Rifles of Canada landed. Here are some then and now comparison shots. Sadly Canada House was closed for visits when we were there. Just behind Canada House is Bernière Sumer's old station. Today it is a visitor centre and a flower shop but around D-Day it was the scene of German soldiers having been captured by the Allies awaiting their transportation to POW camps. The railway has long disappeared and the station was closed in 1950. And the hook! In the street just around the corner from the station is where traces of D-Day can still be seen 
in the form of damage to the pavement edge caused by a tank. During and after D-Day, Aromanch was at the centre of the de-embarkation activities. At the initiative of Winston Churchill, the Allies started to build an artificial, partially floating harbour in the shape of a semicircle with a radius of 2.5 kilometres with Aromanch as its centre. Special caissons were constructed to shield the harbour from stormy weather. The unloading of vehicles, soldiers and goods took place via mile-long floating bridges headed by a bridgehead on adjustable legs. In a separate video I will discuss this so-called Mulberry Harbour in great detail. Today many of the harbour elements are still visible around Aromanche. Some can even be visited close up at low tide. A good place to obtain far more information about these harbours is the Disembarkation Museum, Musée du Débarquement. The floating bridges consisted of rows of bridge elements, so-called whales, that rested on pontoons. Whales can still be seen in many places in the D-Day area. One of the locations that were also on our list to visit was the British Normandy Memorial near Vers sur Mer. As we set out to leave Aramanche after lunch to visit this memorial, we didn't really have any high expectations of what we were about to see. But oh boy, what a mistake that was. It turned out to be the most emotional visit of the five days that we spent in the D-Day landings area. British veterans always regretted the fact that until recent there was no memorial to their huge role during D-Day, until in 2019 the site of this memorial was inaugurated by then Prime Minister Theresa May and French President Emmanuel Macron to commemorate 75 years of D-Day. The official opening was on the 6th of June 2021 by Prince Charles. It was a sober event due to Covid. The memorial was erected at Gold Beach, one of the two beaches where the British landed. It has a rectangular shape consisting of walls and 160 columns with the names of 22,442 men in British uniform who lost their lives on D-Day and the days thereafter. Obviously I searched for names of my British family but had no idea whether the ones I found were relatives. What really impressed us was the special project that had been erected for the 80th celebration of D-Day called Standing with Giants. Volunteers had been working for four years to cut and weld man-sized black silhouettes of 1,475 servicemen with their heads bowed to the ground. These were the victims of D-Day itself. The shadows on the meadow of wild flowers created a surreal, highly emotional scene, especially when trying to look through their eyes to see and understand the terror, fear and war atrocities that they must have experienced moments before their death. Hopefully this footage can capture some of that emotion.
as a Standing with Giants memorial can be visited until September this year and is most certainly worthwhile. British casualties of the 1944 invasion are not buried near the memorial but at the British War Cemetery on the edge of Bayeux. Initially we thought that we were in the wrong place for the British cemetery when we passed by car and saw what looked like a small local cemetery. However we later realised that this cemetery is much larger than what can be seen from the road. The graves are placed much closer together compared to the American War Cemetery at Colfield sur Mer. In fact, with 4,642 graves, it is the largest Commonwealth World War II cemetery in France. The layout is impressive, and another plus is that each grave can be visited without signs saying keep off the grass, like in Colville. Graves are clearly marked with the name, rank, regiment and date of death. As can be seen in my other videos about D-Day, glider planes played an important role on D-Day. In particular the capture of Pegasus Bridge across the river Orm near the town of Ranville, just south of Wiesterham at the British Salt Beach is a memorable event. As part of Operation Coupe de Main, six horse glider planes landed within 42 meters from the bridge, carrying in total six platoons with 181 men. The German garrison was completely overwhelmed by the attack, which lasted less than 15 minutes. Ham and jam was the code word they used to report back to their commanders that the operation had been successful. A bust of its commander, Major John Howard, can be seen on the banks of the River Orn, close to the bridge. Just behind the bridge is the Memorial Pegasus Museum, opened on the 4th of June 2000 by Prince Charles. Apparently the original bridge that was present during World War II was replaced during 1994 and moved to the museum. The museum itself holds an interesting collection of objects related to D-Day. Among other there is a small version of a statue in commemoration of Bill Millen the so-called Mad Piper, who played his bagpipe on Sword Beach amidst the ongoing battle. Apparently the original bridge that was present during World War II was replaced during 1994 and moved to the museum. The new bridge doesn't look much different compared to the old bridge. Originally named Benouville Bridge, the bridge was renamed Pegasus Bridge just after D-Day in honour of the Pegasus emblem of the 1st British Airborne Division. Near the original bridge is a replica of a horse glider plane. Sadly none of the original glider planes survived as they were chopped up by farmers or used for temporary housing. The replica is well made but sadly not much effort was put into the construction of the cockpit. I was hoping to see the original steering mechanism, consisting of steering wheels linked by bicycle chains to the controls, as well as rudimentary navigation instruments. Fortunately parts of an original horse glider could still be seen behind glass.
After visiting the museum, we crossed the bridge to visit the famous Pegasus Bridge Café that at the time of D-Day was run by Madame Thérèse Gondré and her husband Georges. It is here that the British glider pilots rested after having captured the bridge. Here are some shots of the café. I guess the café gets too much attention by today's visitors to the D-Day area as I was not really met by a warm welcome but instead shooed away when I tried to make some shots of the café's interior. Perhaps I should not have barged in with my 4K camera. Of course, a visit to the American War Cemetery at Colville-sur-Mer was also on our program. On the way there, we passed Saint-Laurent-sur-Mer, where a memorial similar to the one at Bernier-sur-Mer can be seen. This small seaside village is close to where the Mulberry A Harbour was destroyed during a heavy storm that raged for four days from the 19th of June 1944 onwards. A stainless steel memorial called Le Brave was erected here for the 60th anniversary of D-Day in 2004. Colville-sur-Mer itself is a small but interesting place. Its church was destroyed in 1944 but rebuilt. Many casualties of World War II are buried in the churchyard. The American cemetery overlooks the golden sand of Omaha Beach, thus not far from where many of the American casualties fell. The way the cemetery is laid out is truly impressive. Rows after rows of white crosses are laid in a symmetrical pattern. An occasional grave with a Jewish cross interrupts the rows of white crosses. In total 9,388 American soldiers are buried here, spread over 70 acres of grassland with many trees. At the bottom end of the cemetery is a chapel with a magnificent painted ceiling. An inscription says it all. I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Near the entrance is a commemoration area with as its centerpiece a remarkable bronze statue depicting the spirit of the American youth rising from the waves. On the walls of the semicircle memorial are two maps that depict the combat activities and movements on and after D-Day in Normandy and Europe. You can spend an hour there studying these maps and arrows in detail, provided you have some pre-knowledge of World War II history.
The last place we visited was the German gun battery at Pointe du Hoc at Omaha Beach. It was here that American Rangers of the 2nd and 5th Battalion had great difficulties to climb the 35 meter high steep cliffs to try to capture this gun position. More than half the men lost their lives. Once on top of the cliff, they noticed that the guns had already been abandoned some days before. The Germans had constructed six concrete casemats there, of which two were unfinished at the time of D-Day. Unlike at Longue Sumer, the 15 cm guns had a range of about 20 km, thus being able to cover both Omaha and Utah beaches. <laughs> Apparently, Pointe du Hoc is a very popular D Day location to visit. There are plenty more places to visit around the D-Day beaches and most certainly worth coming back next time. Thanks for watching.